You're listening to Back to the Roots Podcast. I'm Mike Klein, and along with Brian Wood, we are at the North Central Ohio Dairy Grazing Conference, and we're sitting down with Gene DeBruin, who is a farmer, a nutritionist, and also a farm manager, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Gene, thanks for joining us. Uh, could you give yourself a, a little bit of an introduction? Sure, sure. Um, Gene DeBruin, uh, live in Southern Ohio, been grazing my own milk cow since 1990. Uh, been spring seasonal all those years been organic since 2006 um i was a dairy nutritionist from 86 until 2014 and then in 2014 a good friend of mine decided he wanted to build some dairy so we've we've built three dairies and we're currently milking about 580 cows on the three farms on the three farms and they're they're also certified organic mm-hmm. where do you ship your milk to <clears throat> so the milk at home goes to organic valley and the farms I work for go to Horizon. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what kind of breeds do you have on the three farms? Okay. So the three farms, we're using exclusive Kiwi Cross, LIC genetics. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and what is a Kiwi Cross? So what Kiwi is? Cross, that's a New Zealand Holstein crossed with a New Zealand jersey. And you can get different amounts. They're, they're by 16th. And we're shooting for 7 16th Holstein and 9 16th jersey. We want a thousand pound cow that'll run close to a five fat and a three eight protein, make about forty five pounds of milk. And what drove those <clears throat> genetics being what was sought after? Was it the grazing? Was it the components? Was it the mm-hmm. size or what? Lots of things. So we started these farms with jerseys three years ago. So all the stalls and the parters are booked for thousand pound cows. Um did not like the livability of the Jersey calves. You know, we have hired help. And these New Zealand things, they live. They're like little trucks when they come out. Um, and they keep their condition better. The breeding is going to be not a lot better. Jerseys are pretty fertile. But the feet's already been better. Because, um, you know, those cattle over there have been grazed for 130 years, and they've just been selected that way. And my fear was they wouldn't milk as good. But I've talked to several people that's been using these kiwi, and we can easily get our 45 pounds of milk with 10 pounds of corn in and, and our pasture. Mm-hmm. So. What drove you in the first place you said back you started grazing in the 90s Mm -hmm. what what you know that's pretty early in the movement of Mm -hmm. the whole grazing thing what was the i grew up in southern ohio and everybody grazes in southern ohio at that time lots of little dairies we had hills i was down old man's cave area you know where that is but it's very hilly very steep um and so all you can really do is graze. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, crap, I can put up five or six wires and rotate my cows. And then we just got more serious about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's a, and spring seasonal is not new either. I mean, and where I come from, if you had hills, you, you calved in the spring, you milked on your pastures. If you had bottom land, you grew corn silage and you calved in the fall. I mean, that's been going on down there for eons. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. And you started, you were a nutritionist starting in 86? Yes. Was that right out of college? Or? Yes, right out of college. Actually, I was in college yet, two years. Mm-hmm. So I, I sold feed and was going to finish in my school. And did you, you grew up on a farm? Nope. My uh, grandparents milked. My dad farmed with them for a short time. They didn't get along very well. Dad moved off the farm. Um, but my brothers and I, we had sows and about 60 sows in high school and beef cows. So mm-hmm. we had to drive 20 minutes every day to do something. But that's, oh, really? That's what we did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you had an interest in dairy nutrition mostly, or was it just was yeah. it beef uh, or dairy? What happened is early on I figured out we don't have enough land that you can afford to make a living with beef cows in Ohio. So if he's going to have cattle, dairy made a lot of sense. And, you know, you got to remember in the 80s, how bad the farm, you know, dairying was still pretty darn good. It mm-hmm. looked pretty attractive to me. And it's it's been a good life. Raised our kids on the place and see them grow up. And mm-hmm. Yep. So you said you're milking like 30-something cows at home mm-hmm. and then managing the dairies with a total of 580. Yeah, so. there'll be like 650 by next fall. So there's about 200 cows on each farm. That is correct, except we just made a major change three weeks ago. Um, the one set of facilities are 25 years old and had some issues. So we just got done moving all our cows. So we're going to milk on the two new units and we're going to raise heifers on the, on the other place. So there's two milking facility, two milking farms with 
milking cows. Correct. At this point, yeah. And there's 300 free stalls in the one place and 350 on the other. And we're going to have heifer. So we did. We just moved the stalls and made them fit the cows. Sure. So yeah. now yeah. we're milking in two-year-old facilities, and the help really likes the new parlors. Mm-hmm. You know, they work mm-hmm. better. So. What kind of parlors do you have in? They're swing tans with takeoffs. Okay. Yep. That way one person can milk. Mm-hmm. We have two a lot of times, but you're you're not overwhelmed with 25 units, you know. How long does it take you to milk 250 cows? Um, We can milk about 100 cows an hour with two people and about 75 cows an hour with one. So anywhere from two and a half to three hours. Uh, And we got the herd split spring and fall. Mm. So what I try to do is have one person milk one herd, one person milk the other herd, and the second person also feeds calves. So sometimes there's two in there, sometimes there's one. That way folks can do different things. And then tomorrow maybe you'll feed grain and and scrape, especially in the winter. We got a lot of barns. That way we ain't stuck in the barn all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and we I'm also a, we I'm, got it set up five on, two off is what okay. we're trying to do. 45-hour weeks. Okay. Yeah. How many employees? So there'd be four, nine. Nine. Plus myself, ten. Mm-hmm. And what about the grazing side of things? You know, with the 30 cows at home, that's especially in the organic, you know, I shouldn't say in the, in the organic world, but just grazing larger numbers and meeting that, that dry matter intake requirement. It's pretty easy. Yeah. It's pretty easy. I mean, so if you're going to be organic and grazing is part of it, you just make sure you got 0.8 or 0.9 acres of cow. And in our part of the world, we can fully feed those girls that and grain for 80, 90 days. And then what we do is we supplement one bale of baleage per 120 cow group. And if that's not enough, we might supplement a second bale. Last year was wet. We never went over a bale. So we was feeding 70% pasture dry matter the whole summer. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you don't have enough acres, probably shouldn't pursue that business. <laughs> you know, I think Mike had asked a while about, you know, some things that's changed in the last 15, 18 years since I've been organic. And I think that is what has changed as, as grains getting dearer, fuels, everything's higher, right? People are definitely getting more serious about the grazing and the, mm-hmm. and now this butterfat thing's real important. Um, and once again, you know, they're feeding less feed, less grain. So we got to have better forages to get decent production and health and all that. So mm-hmm. I think the biggest change I've seen is when the organic world has been a lot more emphasis on the grazing. Mm-hmm. And I, I think we're seeing that, especially on the smaller farms. Of course. Uh, so the tractor costs just as much for 40 cows as 400. It does. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, if if you have the big equipment to do the work, it's some people think it's easier than managing grazing. But with a small guy that's got to do all the field work himself, uh, the grazing aspect has a lot more oh, appeal so to it. So much less labor. But even on these, these dairies that I'm working with, you know, um, we got a 75 horsepower loader tractor and a 20 horsepower Kubota side by side, and that's all the equipment we have. We got a hay unroller that goes on the tractor, and we got a a pusher blade to scrape the manure. Um, and trust me, everybody has a party. They have a pizza party when we turn the cows out. You know, we got brand new facilities, liquid manure. It's all taken care of for them. But still, people understand it's a lot less work having them cows outside than in the barn. You know, and mm-hmm. the cows are happy and they're clean. It's great when you come time the milk and there might be one dirty cow out of 200, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. With the grazing... Uh, it- would you say with working with your smaller herd at home and the larger herds that you're managing, is there anything different as far as paddock sizes, yes. species yes, of yes. grasses, so, all that so, kind of So stuff? we're in southern Ohio. We have a lot of heat stress. So all our pastures are based on fescue. Um, and it gets a bad rap or whatever. But, you know, if everything's in fescue and the cows don't know any different, they eat it pretty darn good. You have to have lots of legumes. You, you got to manage it, right? Um, the second thing is basically you can run 40 to 50 cows on an acre in a day. So if the herd is 120, you need to have two and a half acres. So, you know, at Premier where I work, we got five acre fields, four milkins. So it's just got to be size. At home, I have 40 cows, I have three acre pastures, four milkins. Mm-hmm. I just like to you. No, it didn't. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So you run the cows, you say, a group of 120. Correct. Do you do you have, like, the high-production cows and the low-production cows separate for milking? No, we purpose? just have a spring herd in the fall. Yes. Basically, we have a spring herd okay. and a fall herd. Okay. So so since we've consolidated, we're going to have 
the one farm has a lot more pasture than the other farm. So we're going to have two spring herds and a fall herd on that farm. And we'll have two fall herds and a spring herd on the one that has the less pasture because the cows go dry. Of course, the intakes go way down. Mm-hmm. So July and August, we can still get 60, 70% forage into our dry cows. Okay. So. Mm-hmm. Now you said with the, the tractors, the, the, the equipment that you have, you're not making any hay on those farms. We're not making any hay. You buy everything. Well, well, we have other farms that we own. Okay. And we have custom operators make all that in the hay. I see. And our goal is to make it all dry and wrap what we have to. And this year we wrap most of it because we had a really wet year. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you raise your own corn as well? Do not. You buy all the yeah. Grain what in? we do is we grow wheat whenever we want to resow our hay fields, and we have enough of that. We usually have our own bedding, so we have our bedding. We have our forage, and we buy corn screenings for the cows. Okay. No silage. No silage. Mm-hmm. How come no silage? Well, when you have corn silage, then you need protein. An organic bean meal is sixteen hundred dollars a ton. An organic corn is five hundred a ton. Um, when you have corn silage, then you need a TMR mixer. See, now we got these hay unrollers, and we can feed a bell every five minutes. So we can feed all, say, 200, 300 cows in less than an hour and a half. You know, when you make a batch of TMR, it takes an hour, and then you fed 80 or whatever. We need a humongous equipment. Then you need a loader, and you got to have four or five tractors running, you know. And this way, one person go out and unroll a few bales of hay, and it's good. Mm-hmm. Do you have fence line feed or do you feed outside? Fence line feed. Fence line feed. We do feed outside as well. When it's froze, mm-hmm. dry stock can go out and we unroll it on the pastures. Mm-hmm. And unrolling is not the right word. We got a thing called a hustler, if you guys are familiar with a hustler, but it, it cuts it in eight or 10 inch pieces. Mm. And we like that because we also have better freeze stalls with it. So we put the straw in there and it pukes it into our freeze stalls or we can make it down our fence line feeder. And we also winrow out in the fields with that thing. That way they line up, but they don't waste near as much. Mm-hmm. And during the grazing season, we also use the hustler to we feed the bellage right on the pasture. Okay. Well, you windrow in the pastures with that machine? Yes. So do you do that before every grazing? No. So our plan is in the spring when it's cool, we have plenty of forage to eat grass and to eat grain. In the summer when it starts getting hot, you know, we have 40 to 50 days over 90 sometimes 97, 98. So we feed the bellage of a morning. We turn them out to a small bit of grass. That gets them busy for an hour, hour and a half. And then we get out there with the bellage, feed the bellage. They suck that down. About 11 o'clock, they're getting hot. They go to the freestyle barn and cool off. And then evening, we feed just grass. Okay. Also, and being out there in the dark with equipment, mm-hmm. you know, it's just nice to have it in daytime. Mm-hmm. No skid loader? No, no skid loader. The barns are... They're one row freestyle barns, so they're long and skinny. And um, so there's a scrape alley, which are single row of freestalls. And then the alley is not covered, so that gives us our outdoor access with the organic rules. So the feed is also exposed to the weather. Mm-hmm. So, like we had that big rain event yesterday, you know, once a week we usually go down and scrape out some of our feed and throw it away, or it gets ruined, you know. But it's. The cows are going to sort some of that anyways, right? So it's not a huge, huge waste. Probably get four or five manure spreader loads a year of throwaway mm-hmm. feed. Do you have somebody that hauls your manure for you? We do. We do. So the custom operators make the hay and deliver it to the farms. Another custom operator hauls the manure away. So we want our folks just to take care of That's why we can run 70, 80, 90 cows a person because they're just milking cows. They're just moving fence. They're just doing bedding. You know, we're not making asking them to do any field work except clipping some pastures Mm -hmm. so when this model was set up uh on the farm managed farms was it was it the ask of the owner that they wanted this somewhat low input uh facility or was this kind of a brainchild that you had seen enough models that had worked and you wanted to yeah it's some of recommendation some of both so he's he's when I was a nutritionist, he was my boss for 17 years. So he's seen my farm work. And we both understood that 85% of the milk is 95% of the money. So we set it up that way. So he, he bought me a farm and says, I don't want a Yugo and I don't want a Cadillac. Go build me something. So this is what I came up with, good or bad. <laughs> it's, if it's bad, it's my fault. If it's good, it's my fault. But that's what we did. And is it working? It is working. The facilities are working really well. Um, 
we got one really committed family, and that farm is 95% of all the ghouls all the time. The other farm, we've had some people issues. Um, we had a couple, a young Mennonite couple who's doing a great job, but her family has a bakery down in Tennessee, and she had a chance to go home and take over the family business. And I understand. But then we had turnover, right? So that happened about six weeks ago. Okay. So we're just in process to get our new crew put together. But uh, And that's the biggest headache of this for me is the folks. But how we're set up, if you come and you milk and you do a good job, then you get a chance to buy the cows. And then once you buy the cows, while you're buying the cows, you get the milk check and you rent the facilities from us. After you own the cows, you can rent the facilities. You can buy them. We don't care. And we can build another farm. So there is something in place to build more of these? we got another two properties if we want. We're growing hay on them currently, but we could build more. What would you change if you built another set of facilities? Would you do it exactly like this? Are you happy with everything, or are there little tweaks? That yeah, there's would- one tweak. So we got we got walk-in part of you walk in, which is really nice for the people. The cows come in, and they leave out the sides. And the next barn would have steps for the people. The cows would go straight through. So you go down is, steps into the pit, into you say? Into the pit. I would not have the walk-in. It's, it's worse for the people, but you're only going down them steps one time to milk 100 cows, right? And now what the problem, it is nice when you're getting calf milk or whatever, you can mm-hmm. just bring it out. But the cows do not like making that turn and leave. They go through, the cows look so much better when they, because you can open the front gate, the cows leave, sucks the next group in. That's how my barn is at home. Okay. You just manage that front gate, you know, and. The last cow's out, you close the gate, and the next group's already standing there. They just follow each other. But when you have to go backwards, you have to leave the doors closed. They have to all leave. Well, they don't want to leave. The feed's there, da 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 They finally leave, and then the next group comes. So I bet it would add, we could probably milk 20 more cows an hour just with cow flow. So you, you have you seen Mark Martin and Ernest Martin, their parlors? They've got the rapid exit. You know, where you walk into the pit level, Yep. the cows are re- elevated, yep. Yep. then rapid exit, they just go straight out to the side and then back. That's how ours is. Okay. Do you have I, rapid exit or? Yeah. Okay. I don't like it. You don't like it? Just my opinion. Mm-hmm. But, you know, everybody has their opinion. Now, do you, so your cows come in and go up an incline? Yeah. So the, the holding pen is 100 and some feet long and they have to go up a total of 30 inches. So it's a real okay. gradual incline. But the cows like standing uphill. But that's no facing. Um, we don't chase them. Mm-hmm. I mean, we should be feeding the part, especially. I mean, we might have to get in five or six heifers or something at the end, but pretty much they come in. But so when you the rapid exit, see if you if you don't if you don't have each group leave the barn before you're bringing the next group, you have so much manure. The cleanup time takes more time than waiting on the next group to come in. Does that make sense? Mm. In our situation, we're better off waiting for them girls to leave than that next group in. And if there's one person in the parlor, it's not a problem. When there's two, there's a lot of standing, not a lot, but you know, standing around. Mm-hmm. Cause Downtime. we got 10 milkers, yeah, right? Downtime. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you know, nothing's perfect. Cause you feed grain like, in the parlor. We do feed grain in the parlor. Okay. We started out not, that's kind of against my wishes, but we end up feeding them. It's, it's much better. Because what we're doing, we're feeding in that feed rail, and you have to wait for the group to eat. Well, that's 20 minutes, and it don't take it on to set up. So now we just show up, we milk the cows. Okay. And then what, when the cows come in, there's three on a shift, so the one person is the outside person. They scrape the, the single row in about 20 minutes. And they start dropping hay down. When the first group comes back, they may wait five minutes, and they got fresh feed, cleaned out stall. You know, As we get the cows in, we, we kick out the stalls with a pitchfork. Mm. So basically that group is done for the day or for the milking and then the evening we'll just do the same thing was this kind of uh the that sounds similar to the new zealand style you know like missouri they've right, got these right. new zealand. yeah so i was seasonal for 30 years you know and the reason i'm really big on the spring and the fall seasonal is it's all in all out for the calves we can clean the facilities out completely we got sand in there everything dies with just the curtains sanitized that's and and because folks don't really like feeding calves, mm-hmm. so you got a big glut of little calves and it's a pain in the patootie. And a month later, they're all eating off self feeders really good. And two months later, they're all weaned, and then you get a break for three months. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so that is the main thing. Mm-hmm. It's for the people and for the calves. Plus, it's a lot simpler because now you just have a few groups of heifers, right? You got your calves, your six to twelve, your twelve to eighteen, your eighteen to twenty-four months. Everything's in a group. 
12, 18, you breed them as a group. Everything's, you know, it's real simple to manage when you got several sites. Mm-hmm. Is one of the farms the former Perry Klutz farm? Yeah, that's the heifer farm. Now. That's now the heifer farm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I was on that farm. Uh, that's got irrigation on it, too. It does. It does. Mm-hmm. It's a real gravel farm. Mm-hmm. And we'll continue to irrigate in that place. Okay. And we can grow a lot of hay there. And good pasture. You know, we, we can run a lot of heifers over there. It's just mm-hmm. the facility was getting really tired, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and everything was loose housing. You get 250 cows, a lot of straw. This way we can run heifers for nine months on the pasture. It's not near as much straw to run heifers on pack. Mm-hmm. So there's nothing wrong with the facility. It's just not what I, it's just not the best for us, mm-hmm. you know. So we, we still got a lot of How many there. acres was that farm? About 430. 430. Because mm-hmm. you, you would have gotten across the road as well? Correct. From the dairy facility? Correct. Okay. It's like 120 acres across the road. So okay. that's mostly hay, though, mm-hmm. across the road. Yeah, because uh, we actually had Perry was a speaker at the original organic farming conference. Um, so I've known Perry. Is he retired? or? Yeah, he's retired. That's not true. Perry, um, he builds houses and rehabs houses. He's in Florida doing that. Oh, no kidding. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Doing real well, from what I understand. Mm-hmm. Good. So. And, you know, also the New Zealand model, what I kind of meant by that, too, was the employees are are gaining a, you know, part of their paycheck is the purchasing right, the right. cattle. So, so we're not doing it that way at yeah, all. It's okay. not like the share milking. What we're okay. doing is you get paid a wage, and then once you're committed and you want to do it and we're happy with what you're getting done, then you get the milk check and you buy the cows from us. I see. And so... If you want to pay yourself a lot, a lot of money, it takes forever to buy the cows. If you're willing to pay, take less money, you can buy the cows really fast. And that's kind of up to you at that point. But we're doing a land contract. So three years into it, you decide this is not for you. We don't have a farm without cows. Right. But at the end, we finance it. So at the end, you get the cows and and then you can leave. Mm-hmm. You can do what you want. They're your cows. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty neat model. It's like a startup Mm-hmm. It is know, startup. incubator type thing mm-hmm. that you can get somebody going without making the huge investment on their own. Really none. Right. Because yeah. the equipment's there. I mean, that's the deal. So once you own the cows and you buy the equipment, you know, then you can decide if you want to buy the farm or rent the farm. Mm-hmm. So, Do you have a lot of interest from people who want to work there and have? We have a lot of interest in folks that want to come milk cows. Really? We're really struggling to find people that want to manage the farms. I mean, you still milk four or five times a week because that way you know what's going on, right? But really and honestly, the, our biggest struggle has been managers. Hmm. I got a list. A lot of people want to come work. And, and I don't know if it's the area I live in because there's a lot of blue-collar jobs in that area. But it's amazing how a few people really want to become that responsible person so that they can do this. And I think it's a commitment problem. I think mm-hmm. folks, that, and I don't mean this mean, but under 30 years old, you know, everything in their whole life has been change, 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 you know, and this is a 10 year thing and it scares people 10 years. Yeah. But gosh, you know, you're worth a million dollars after 10 years, but folks, it's a commitment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I I mean, we've seen it as, you know, in the farms that we work with too, you know, the younger generation, we watch, you know, dad make a good life for a family, Mm -hmm. but then the kids are seeing, you know, I, I work a lot in northern Indiana, and they've got the trailer factories where they can make big, big money. And they go do it. And they go do it. And, uh, you know, these farm kids are seeing those people, and I, this is true. I'm just using that as an example, but uh, are watching the their peers have, after 2 o'clock in the afternoon, totally free Correct. to do whatever they want. But that's the reason I set this up with five on. Right. Two. That was our thinking, too. We wanted to have a 40, 45 hour, just mm-hmm. like working at the plant, mm-hmm. you know, and that part's, that's why I say we, we don't have a, we have a lot of folks that's sick of the assembly line or wherever they're working would like to come work with cows, but it's the management part is what we've struggled with. Hmm. Uh, we got, a, like I said, one young couple that graduated ATI at Worcester, they've been there three years. They're shining stars. I mean, they're, they're going to make this work and, and soon they're going to get a chance to buy these cows. Well, the other place we'll see, you know, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So let's get into the nutrition side of things okay. a little bit, uh, you know, with how long you've been doing it. And do you primarily work with organic 
farmers or are you working with? So, so for years I was a nutritionist, you know, there was no organic. Mm -hmm. So I worked with little herds, big herds. It didn't matter. Um, and then primarily the last four or five years, I quit being a nutritionist in 14. From like 2010 on, mostly it was grazing is what was happening in Southern Ohio. It's either grazing organic or non-organic. Now the last three years, I've just been concentrating on these farms that I'm managing. Sure. Um, but my opinion, you know, I'm really big on perennials because you always get the spring flush and you always get a fall flush and you can deal with the 60 days in the summer with whatever. Um, and I'm really big on growing your protein, as much energy as you can, and, and add a little bit of energy if you need to. It's always the cheapest, right? Corn is always the cheapest or wheat, whatever. So that that's my basic premise. Grow your forages, grow all the protein you can, keep your fiber low, you get a lot of intake, and then we'll worry about supplementing if we need to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you work with farmers on making that quality of forage that, and what what have you seen on making that quality for yeah it's it's actually pretty simple i mean in, you want to cut the hay early so my part of the world that's the 10th of may or the 5th of may and every 30 days after that and then whatever the weather lets you do if you're cutting clover maybe it's 10 days behind the alfalfa you know um and if it's pure grass you cut it like alfalfa cut it every 28 30 days and it's it's all about maturity you know everybody talks about brown midrib and all these other things, but it doesn't matter. It's all really good if it's cut on time. Cows will do well. So it's really not rocket science. And I think we've tried to make this nutrition thing so complicated, and I've never seen a cow yet that got really excited about numbers. <laughs> you know, They want a belly full of good food, and when it comes out the back end, it can't look like a horse turd, right? If you, That's a good start. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, like I say, especially in the organic world, you know, we don't have the pesticides. We don't have anything. So annuals are a real pain. So that's why I'm really big on the perennials. Mm -hmm. Like I say, you know, at Premier, we grow wheat to restart our alfalfa or clover fields. But it's a pretty easy crop to grow, right? You disc it a couple times in the fall. You plant it. By spring, it's gone. You don't have a lot of weeds in it, you know. Um, but corn, you know, you basically got to beat your farm to death to grow it. It's a lot of work for you and the animals or the tractor, whatever you're doing, and, and the soil. So that's just my opinion. We still feed corn. I'm not anti-corn. I'm just thinking on our land, we can make more money growing the forage and we'll buy the corn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what tips would you have for, there's a big movement in grass-fed milk. Yes. Um, and grass-fed beef is also yes. growing like crazy. Yes. Uh, what can they do from a, from a nutritionist who balances a ration mm -hmm. with grain? Okay. Generally, what can, I mean, it's obviously forage quality is the main thing. It is the main thing. But what can we do? Some of these guys are really struggling with production. And with production, the MUNs as well, probably too high. Actually, this, this winter, not bad. This summer we had some, you know, upper teens. Okay. But okay. nothing in the 20s. Well, a couple, three things. You have to have 30% clovers in your pasture to grow enough nitrogen in an organic pasture. So that's kind of a given, right? And then I'm really big on Forbes, chicory and plantain. I like to have 20, 30% of that. And then 40, 50% grass. Um, the next thing you do, if you have all those Forbes, they're super digestible even if they're 40 days old, right? So I like a 28 day round on my rotation. Let the grasses get a little more fiber to them. And that fixes your muns and it keeps them getting stupid loose. But yet you got all that quality from your Forbes and your clover. And if you got to clip it once or twice a year, you clip it. Don't get excited. It's cheap. It's $5 an acre to clip. So just clip them weeds off for the seed heads, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and by doing that year after year after year, your grasses will get deeper rooted. You know, everything will be a better sod. And um, you get a more balanced ration. That'll be a 17, 18% protein feed. As far as your stored feed, you know, like I said, I'm pretty big on alfalfa and a grass. It's not real complicated there either. I think 60% alfalfa. So maybe you plant 16, 18 pounds of alfalfa and three or four pounds of orchard grass or six or eight pounds of fescue. And over a four or five year life, it peters out. Put back your wheat or whatever you're going to do, corn for silage, I don't care. And start your alfalfa again. Mm -hmm. But uh, the guys I've seen with the grass fed, if you're grazing your grass four or five inches tall, 
super lush, you know, it squirts through them. Mm-hmm. And once again, on the quality thing in the winter, you know, if you don't cut your hay on time, I mean, if you can't fix it with grain, management just becomes harder or more important. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody thinks this grass fed is simpler. Well, kind of. You don't have to run the grinder. The, I know. But, but you have to manage your forage. The management better. is a lot more intensive. Uh, now, some of the f- local farmers have started raising a dry stalk, male sterile sorghum that shoots a seed head, right. but it's sterile with no, with no seeds. Correct. High sugar. And that makes milk. It's a corn silage. Yes. So it's a really good energy source. I really like that because yeah, it'll control the months. It works great. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. It's a it's a great uh, crop to go in to re- reseed a pasture or Correct. reseed a hay reseed field. A hay field. Yep. Uh, yep. So are they chopping that? Yes, or? they. It actually dries down like corn silage, mm-hmm. so they can direct chop it. Uh, and, they're, and they're planting that in rows. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thirty uh, inch rows. That works good. Like I say, you know, I'm pretty big on the wheat, and then falling out with sorghum Sudan. Just because the people I work with, you know, don't want to. We have Johnson grass. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of weed issues in our, you know, the pigweed. You've heard all these horror stories. We have them. Mm-hmm. So corn is a real pain. So we, from. we don't have Johnson grass. Here. Exactly. And you don't have some of the, the <laughs> water hemp. That's the word I'm trying to think of. Okay. Some of these pigweeds are really nasty. They'll mm-hmm. go to seed every 30 days or 20 days or 10 days. I mean, <laughs> They're, you know, as the summer gets on, they get more desperate to keep making more mm-hmm. seed. So, you know, like I said, I'm not against corn. I feed mm-hmm. it. No. But but I do think on an all grass thing, it, it's all about the quality. And you have to pay more attention to rumen. So everybody talks about that. And uh, it's really simple. The rumen's on the left side as you're looking at her butt. So in the afternoons, when you get ready to milk in the afternoon, if that stomach is it touching them ribs or further out than the ribs, completely full? She's not getting enough feed. You're talking the short ribs? Yes. Up top? Well, no, even the side ribs. Even the side ribs? It ought to be pressing those I'll, ribs. Okay. And if it's not, if it's skinny, she don't have enough to either. It's too hot or whatever, but you start to supplement feed. And I think that's what happens on the all grass. Guys wait too long. The cows start getting thin. Then they're, oh, my gosh. Well, they've lost their milk and they lost condition and they lost breeding and all that. So I've been really be surprised how good the condition is on those cows because it feels like a grass-fed cow loses milk production before she loses body condition. Now, I don't know, is that just from, because I have to score all our grass milk herds Mm -hmm. every year, Mm -hmm. and this was the third year, and they're they're better and better. Every year it's gotten better. I think there's two things going on there. One is a cow will lose weight for 30, 40 days, and if she's not peaking at, I don't know if the Holstein, peaking at 90, she's peaking at 50, She's not going to burn as much off. Mm-hmm. Right? The second thing, your guys are just figuring it out. Mm-hmm. After three years, they saw skinny cows the one year. We're not doing that next year, right? They're mm-hmm. just, I think they're probably more aggressive. Uh, and, you know, some of them have headlocks where they will give molasses or sugar mm-hmm. uh, to the cows that need it. You know, that's the good, that's management. That's management. Mm-hmm. You know, my dad always say, if you take the man out of management, you don't have much. That's why that name's in there. The man has to actually be out there, or the woman, looking at their cows, knowing what the crap's going on every day. Mm -hmm. Uh, Back to the pastures, you said perennial pastures, and you said 30 or 40% for uh, the mix. You said one thing that, in talking for this podcast, we've kind of heard varying things on length of that pasture life. Mm-hmm. We've heard five to six years, and then you got to turn it over and start over my, again. My pastures I sowed 16 years ago, and I can show you pictures, but they're not a bit weak. But it's fescue. If I was planting orchard grass or rye grass, yeah, five or six, seven years, they start petering out. So it's the variety that makes. Well, a it difference. makes a huge difference, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, but I have a less palatable pasture to deal with, so I'm giving up something. You know, I tell a lot of folks, you know. Uh, Rye grass is like running a Maserati. They run really fast, but when they die, they die fast, right? And, and I'm planting dump trucks. They last forever. You but can't kill a dump truck. It won't go over 80 miles an hour. <laughs> exactly. You can't kill it, but it's not going to go over 80 miles an hour no matter what you do. <laughs> uh, and you're just talking regular Kentucky 31? No. No, end of fight freeze. End of fight freeze. Okay. End of fight freeze. And I, and do you I've use the meta fescues? No, tall no. fescues. Just tall fescues? The, the metal fescues do poor in the summer. 
like I said, we have a lot of heat where we're at anyhow. We have a lot of heat yeah. stress, right? I mean, so um, we use tall fescues. Bronson is one I've used a lot of, probably the most, actually. Okay. Um, Select is one we use a lot of. This Cajun 2, I've tried it. It's worked pretty good. But basically, endophyte freeze. There's nothing wrong with like a bar optima, those um, endophyte friendly fescues. Mm -hmm. But our climate isn't bad enough in southern Ohio. We got deep soils, we get enough rain, we don't have to go there. We can get 30 years out of these ones. But you know, if I lived in Tennessee or I used to live in western uh, Missouri, a lot tougher climate, then I'd go with endophyte, you know, the friendly endophyte. Mm -hmm. Just my opinion. I mean, there's always a looking at it. And if if crops is part of your farm and you want a four or five year rotation, then it's different goals, right? Yeah. My goal is I want permanent pasture because that's what we do. We graze. Mm -hmm. And you're you're also not making hay on the farms where you're grazing. That's correct. So your seedings, you have a different seeding for your hay than correct. you do your pasture. That's correct. Where most of the farmers we work with is Doing both. That the hay fields are hay and pasture. Right. So their seedings, and, and I think they give up. You're either going to give up a little bit of grazing quality or you're going to give up a little bit of hay quality, I, agree. I believe. I agree. And that's why we try to keep it separate. Mm -hmm. we have lots of reasons. One is I don't want to put manure on fields they're going to graze because they don't graze worth a darn anyhow. So if I put it on my hay fields in the fall, has all winter to go away, it's not there in the spring. Cows eat it fine. So now I've got a place for my manure. I have a long wind in the fall after the last cutting of hay before it turns to mud. Um, in my pastures, you know, they recycle 95% of that. So you really your fertility doesn't go down in your pastures. So this way you got a closed loop on both. You got a closed loop when you're grazing, and you got a closed loop on your hay. Mm -hmm. So on going back to your farm, are you going to keep your forty cow dairy at home? Yeah, my my youngest boy's really interested in it. Okay. So we're going to try to set my shit and probably talk about this because it may not work. But we're going to probably milk him once a day this year because mm. he's still in high school. I'm getting really tired of the 95 hour weeks. So I'm going to milk them once a day this year, next year, and then we'll see. We'll probably add a few cows. And then since Organic Valley has a quota, we'll just keep right out our quota that way. Okay. What are you following any models from the once a day, or is it? Uh, have you talked to anybody else that's doing it? Yeah, I've talked to some people. And it doesn't matter. If they're doing it, still they love it. Mm -hmm. And if they're not doing it, still they hated it. So basically, I'm going to try it, and I might be one of them haters. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That sounds terrible. But, but you know, I've only been feeding five, six pounds of grain anyhow to my jerseys at home, and we get 40 pounds of milk. And if they'll milk 27 or 30 pounds for the average, I know my butter, fat, and protein will come up. I can close to break even, half the milkings, you know, until my son gets out of high school, and then we'll probably go back to twice a day. But it'll be for me to bridge a couple, three years here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many acres do you have at home? Just 65. Okay. And you make hay there or you, no, bu you no. buy everything there's, there's in? There's 56 acres in pasture. And we got 35 cows and 20 heifers run on it. Okay. And like this year is a wet year, but most years I won't buy 70, 80 ton a year of hay. Okay. And it's dry cow hay. Mm -hmm. So probably 75, 80% of their total dry matter needs are met by that with permanent pasture because mm -hmm. you're seasonal so when do you dry off i dry off whenever i get tired in the fall this year i made it to the 15th of <laughs> december <laughs> last year i met my quota the 25th of november so i dried off then so if, if i hit my quota i dry off early if i don't hit my quota i kind of watch the weather if it's gonna be really really nat you gotta remember i'm an old guy <laughs> So not a lot of debt. So if I want to quit a couple weeks early, I quit a couple weeks early. Nice. <laughs> I think I think there's going to be a lot of people jealous with that statement. Well, I, I, you can. You can. Um, but you have to take the two dollar deduct in the spring, and you don't get the three dollar up in the winter. And you know all your work happens in March in the mud. You know it's a wet month, and that's when you're having all your calves. I mean, it's not all gravy. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's nice to have that time off in the winter time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When do you freshen back in? So the first week of March. Okay. Yeah. Do you AI at home? Or I do not. So I, don't, I used to, read? but I'm away too mm -hmm. much. So we we just use the bowl. Put them in there for 63 days. They get three tries, 
And uh, pretty much I keep all the first service cows in some second. We sell the third service cows. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you never run short on replacements? You just you keep replacements I, as you need to? I only or? raise nine. You raise nine. So for 33 to 35 cows. Yeah, actually I sold one bread cow last year, but I sold seven bread cows the year before. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it's been no trouble. We, we basically keep half for heifers is what we do. Okay. And once again, I keep them out of the first. They have to be a cow that's had more than one calf, bred on the first service, and then I look at their other, <laughs> other things. Because this breeding is real important with seasonal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've got to hit that window. I do. And like I said, March is messy, but I try to have 95% of my calves in a month of March. So I just got a couple, three running. When I turn out, I don't want a bunch of cows calving. I've got a couple, mm -hmm. three left. You know, I just put them with the herd. The calf in the pasture, mm -hmm. but you're going to have a lot more milk fever, metal. Yeah, I can say that word. Metabolic problems on spring grass, so I want them fresh on the hay. Mm -hmm. And do you keep some really good hay back for when they're calving in the nope, spring? I don't. I don't because you got to remember, I start calving the first week of March, but the second week of March, I got enough milk. You know, it's out of the colostrum. I can start keeping it right. By the fourth week of March, I turn out. So I still got a lot of cows freshening. So I feed these close-up cows, rocket, still got them in one group. Do I feed them rocket fuel hay? So I'd rather give up 400 pounds of milk on the ones that are already fresh to not have any troubles with the rest, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Because a cow is three, four weeks fresh. She's still going to come hit her peak. Mm -hmm. So I've tried a good hay, and, yeah, I can get 50 pounds of milk in March. And now I get 40. Well, it's for two weeks, right? Come April, they're going to milk 70 pounds no matter what hay I fed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're not actually on that hay long enough to like, bring their peak down is no. what you're now, saying. Now, if I was calving in January, mm -hmm. it'd be, you know, or if I couldn't turn out the end of May, till he did, you know, but where I live, I try to calve four weeks. I start calving four weeks before turnout. Mm -hmm. But that's why breeding is so important. I need to get the things fresh during those four weeks mm -hmm. so we can turn them out and make them milk. But, you know, the first week, you really don't want to push them anyhow, right? You got all that swelling, and you're just getting mm -hmm. lost them out of the cow. So, mm -hmm. What causes metabolic issues on cows freshening on pasture? So the real lush spring grass is going to be low, really high potassium, low magnesium, low calcium, so it's milk fever stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Apple cider vinegar. Uh, well, you know what works for me and for these words that I'm managing – Every single cow gets a dose of bova cow. We just give them the big fat pill. It costs five dollars. This goes in them. Mm -hmm. That's just my opinion. If she's drunk, the next day we give her another one. Yeah. It, it, it's simple. It's cheap. You know who had a calf anyhow. You got her caught. Used to get the calf. You grab her by the head, put that pill on there, and it's five dollars, and she's done. Mm -hmm. Now it's. You know, it's 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 overkill because everybody gets it. And some of them don't need it, mm -hmm. but it's simple. Like the apple cider vinegar. So are you going to put it on the feed? Mm -hmm. Especially if you're an all if you're a no grain person, you know. They either put it on the feed or in the water. Okay. So I think it's two ounces per cow per day through the dry period. Um, no milk fever. I'm sure it works. Yeah. But this other way. Yeah, it's just too simple. And for me. the thing is, every farm is like your personal farm and your farms that you manage, two completely different operations. Completely so when different. we look at like feeding the apple cider vinegar, some farms are set up to feed it. Some farms right. aren't. Some are set up for a TMR. A lot of them aren't. You know, so Correct. it's it's uh, you you probably had you had stuff figured out at home on your farm that won't translate to the farms you manage correct that you had to figure it out in a different way there yeah you know so like just like that's how i got started to move a cow i could not get those guys to watch a cow that's gonna go drunk or whatever or get down so i said you know what when you're gonna sell four thousand or five thousand dollars worth of milk what is five dollars <laughs> and i can go to bed knowing everybody's gonna be walking around tomorrow mm -hmm. so i just made it the rule now i thought you know what i could do that at home <laughs> There's no reason. So actually, I learned from that. And brought okay. It home. Mm -hmm. But you're right. A smaller farm, you can do a lot of things. You know, like because I don't, I don't uh, give the bovicac to my two year olds. 
or many of my three-year-olds. But at the farms, it's automatic because they're not going to know who's a two-year-old or a three-year-old. They just give it to them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's the man and management once again, right? You can be a lot tighter on your own family farm than you can Mm -hmm. in a larger deal. Mm -hmm. It sounds like your whole philosophy has been to keep things as simple as possible because of the variabilities that are on so many different farms. You know, simplify it down to the point that there are general concepts that can be followed and then the management can be done after that. Exactly. You know, if you get the basic plan down and you can make it as complicated as you want, and if if it's easy stuff for you to do and you can make that extra 5 or 10% milk, go for it. But if you start figuring out just eating your day up, mm-hmm. then it's probably not a good decision. Mm-hmm. And and what, you know, one guy might think the apple cider vinegar is no problem. Another guy said, I'd rather give the pill. Well, I don't care as long as it's on milk fever. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a hundred ways to skin a cat. So each, each pharmacist has to figure that out. And like I say, some have TMR, you know, as a nutritionist, pretty much I would go see a farm for six or eight times and I'm a talker, but I try to keep my mouth shut and figure out how and why. And then let's make a plan that works for you. Cause it is different on every farm. Mm-hmm. You know, like I said, when I was a kid, you know, if you had a bottom land, you grew corn silage, right? If you had hills, you, you pastured. Well, obviously there's totally different systems for those farms, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What are the general things, you know, when you were working with more farms as a nutritionist, what are the general things that you saw uh, just, you know, that was lacking or missing from the simplified okay. plan? So, so number one, a cow has to have a baby to give milk. And if you don't vaccinate the cows, you're going to have troubles getting them pregnant. So that's something doesn't matter if they had 100 cows, 1,000 cows, or 3 cows. Folks don't like to vaccinate. I don't like to vaccinate. But that's, at least in our part of the world, we have a lot of lepto. We have a lot of issues down there. That's number one. So then breeding, you know, I probably spent more time working with folks' AI program or their bull program than I did with the nutrition a lot of times. Because if they don't have babies, there is no milk. And then the next thing is dry cows. They're not making any money. They tend to get ignored. But they're the start of everything. So if I could help a guy get his cows pregnant and get his cows freshening right, if they have a short lactation, even if you feed them terrible, you're going to sell a lot of milk because you got a lot of fresh cows. So I would say those are the things that over the years, and calves, my gosh. You know, if a calf doesn't, a calf that gets scours then gets pneumonia. And then it gets coccidiosis, right? It's all related. So the next thing I worked really hard on was calves. Clean, 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 clean. Everything's cleaned every day, twice a day. You know, make sure they all get their right amount of milk. It's all fresh. So if we don't scour them, then we have cows that come in with good lungs, you know. They're fat and they're happy. So so probably I spent less time doing rations than I did helping folks with young stock and breeding because that's where the money's made. Mm-hmm. I, well, I, as you were saying that, I, you said dry cows are typically left to, you know, to do whatever. For, sure. You know, a lot of people don't pay attention because they're not making their money. And I'm wondering if the same thing, if you saw a lot of the same things with heifers, you know, a lot of guys. Yes. Yeah. You know, everybody said, well, I want to calve at 24 months. Well, that's great. But if you're calving it, it's two thirds the size of a mature cow. That's not so great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've seen a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't if you don't raise your calves and your heifers right, you're replacing a worn out old cow with a worn out young heifer. <laughs> Basically, I mean you're you're. Well, I, I tell people it's like asking your twelve you know twelve year old girl to have a baby. You know, you got to get them mature. Mm-hmm. You, you can't do that to them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If they're big and they're strong, they clean. They have the calves easy. Once again, it goes right back to the whole loop of getting them bred again. Right, so. Yeah. That's because the animal isn't trying to mature right. while being she's pregnant. Not growing, and she's not also growing while you're milking her. Mm-hmm. It's even worse. Yeah, because if they're still growing in that first lactation, instead of producing milk, she's producing meat. Right. Because she's right. putting mu- on muscle. So everything fails. She don't mm-hmm. milk right, and she doesn't breed back right. Mm-hmm. So that's how you get those 18 month calving intervals on your two year olds. Yeah. I, I saw a lot of that. And that's, it's got better. You know, I'm sitting here bashing, but the truth is. There's been lots and lots of ink written about these things, and people are aware now. But it's still, 
as a nutritionist, I always felt it was kind of my job to prod a guy, hey, you know, let's look at your heifers, mm-hmm. what your calves look like, you know, your dry cows, are they bedded up good? Mm-hmm. Just well, you know, that, I, that typically tells, you know, when we're getting on farms at new farms, potential members of ours, that typically is the first place that I'll pay it. I shouldn't say pay attention, but I'm paying a lot closer attention to the calves and the young stock because that's usually a good indicator of what kind of manager this guy Correct. is. If that's done well, pretty much everything's probably done well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So on on a heifer, what age do you want her to freshen for the 20, first time? 24 months. 24 months, if she's mature. Correct. And what do you what would you tell a farmer if his two-year-old heifer's they're not fed good enough to be mature at that age. Do you encourage him to feed them better or to push out their well, both? I mean, on that group, you pretty much got to push out. Mm-hmm. But then we need to do better. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I would never recommend calving an inky dinky cow, but, you know, we need to do better on your calves. And do you care to hear kind of how I think about feeding calves organic? I'd love to hear it. So, milk is a great coccidia stat. So my thinking is a calf is three months old before its immune system fights coccidiosis worth a darn. So I like to feed them milk for 90 days. And then cause I like self feeders cause it's too much labor with bottles. So, at, so for the first 90 days at five days, they get free choice corn with mineral and grassy hay. They don't have to be good. Hay. I just don't want them eating bedding and getting manure in their mouth and getting sick. So then, uh, when they're 90 days old, we take them off the milk. We give them three quarters of a pound of bean meal and three and a half pounds of corn. And we'll stay on that until they're a year old. This is, this is not grass fed. This is, mm-hmm. so um, we'll do that till they're a year old. And if you do that, you'll be breeding cows, 15 month old heifers. Well, okay. So at, at a year we quit the grain. So they get that three and a half pounds of corn, three quarters of a pound of bean meal from three months to six months. At six months, the room is developed enough. You can take the bean meal out. Then it's just corn from six months to 12 months. And you should be breeding heifers. Like my jerseys always 700 pounds when I breed them. And they'll come in weighing within 50 pounds of a cow. Mm-hmm. And a Holstein will weigh 900 pounds when you breed them. And then if you have a group that you do have poor feed, if you've got a well-grown heifer that's just bred, she can eat that crappy hay and be fine, right? Because she's already grew. Mm-hmm. So people say, well, it's 15 bushels of corn to a heifer i say yep you know so that 15 bushels at ten dollars a bushel let's say it's two hundred dollars a heifer over the next five years you're going to milk her it's forty dollars a year it's 120 pounds of milk will a full-grown heifer at two years old give you 120 more pounds of milk than when it's trying to grow (laughs) i'm sure she will Mm -hmm. i'm sure she will wow and you want a vet bill. You want no problems. And the calf will be alive and you have it to sell. And it just goes on and on, right? Mm-hmm. So that's my thinking. I push them hard the first year. I don't push them with the milk. We just feed them a gallon a day. Mm-hmm. But we make sure they got plenty of feed and hay in front of them. And I'll tell you, at two weeks, they'll start eating. And by the time you wean them, they're, they're eating close to that four pounds of grain. Mm-hmm. So it's not a big stress when you wean them. So how do you feel then, like on the grass fed? They've got high quality grassy hay and yes. from day one yes but then it's milk okay for six a lot of them exactly. go five to six months I, if i was doing that i would i would feed the gallon of milk for three months and a half a gallon of milk for three months okay and that's your protein that you're missing the bean oh meal. the bean meal that's your protein and, oh. and really good hay is the same energy as grain i got no problem with that plan mm-hmm. but the truth is most of us grow some hay that's not the best so mm-hmm. this is the place we can put it with our heifer, as long as we feed yeah. the grain, because I've we have one uh, grass mill farmer who he freshens his heifers at thirty months. He and they're huge and they're mature and they make and milk like crazy. There is and nothing wrong with yeah. that. But he's got he. I think it's a really neat way he feeds his his calves. They're on milk for five months, mm-hmm. and then they're he slowly adds water to the milk for the last month until they're just on warm water. Right. Then once they're totally weaned, they go back in the herd with the cows and are on the same pasture as the, the milking cows. They know are. where all the pastures are. They know everything time they come fresh. Yep. And what it is is they're on the best feed on that farm right after weaning, mm-hmm. and there is no crash, no crash whatsoever. And they, 
I think they could fresh him at 22 months and they'd be mature, but he's got sure, likes to. that's his plan. Yeah, that's There's his plan. And, that. and uh, so he's got some different, uh, like, Fleck V genetics in it. Mm-hmm. So he has got a serious size cow, oh, yeah, you know, when they're fresh animals. and really nice looking cows. So I just, I just think it's interesting. Uh, guys that went all grass were really scared about raising calves without grain. What we're seeing now is the calves that weren't fed grain are a much better grass milk cow because they're they, used to eating. They're used to eating and filling their room without grain. There, there's 25 million beef cows in this country, and those calves hardly get grain, right? Mm-hmm. But the mamas wean them. At, they milk, they milk good for 100 days, and they milk crappy for 100 days, right? We're saying the same <laughs> thing, right? Give them a gallon of milk for 100 days. Give them a half a gallon. Of milk. I mean, they'll do fine. Mm-hmm. And where them them beef cows are eating with their mamas on pasture usually pretty good grass. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, yeah, the plan works, mm-hmm. but it's got to be good hay or good pasture. Yeah, yep. I th- I think you're right, and and those animals know what that is. And when they mm-hmm. come fresh, it's no big shock. Well, like Irvin Barkman, who we had on the podcast about his grass fed, and he went grass fed with the calves and the heifers, young stock, before he ever went with the herd. So when he went grass fed with the milking cows, he already had heifers that, knew what that never doing. gotten grain. And his production is now higher than it was when he fed grain. Wow. So it's really it's a really impressive thing. But I, to me, it's just exciting to see these guys, they're doing something new. It's kind of like making the transition to organics, but to grass fed is... They don't have the toolbox is pretty exactly, barren. Exactly. So they have to be good managers, and to see them figure it out is it's but really. But the truth is, they can do it. Clean, clean, clean animals, mm-hmm. right? Bedding, and and good forages. It's yep. really not complicated. And you look but at that. It's, it's in management, but it's not mm-hmm. complicated management. Yeah. You just got to be timely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Timing is timing there it is, is everything. Sure. Mm-hmm. Everything on a farm is about timing. It, Sure. So can't plant corn in July and make it grow no. well. You can't really. Can't do it. So, well, Gene, anything else you want to share? No, I just want to thank you guys for visiting today. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on. It was really interesting. So, thanks a lot, Gene.